Hello there, and welcome to the 47th episode of Strategic Zoomcast. I'm A.E., and I'm casting some great players in the South. It's Scotch and Nagano, and with me today is a very special guest announcing the players in the, the, the East Side. It's me, Imperial Dane. Give your full introduction, Denmark. Dane. Come on, master of propaganda. Master. I want to hear it. <laughs> master of propaganda here is the right defender of the fatherland. You've got Emperor of Mankind, your lord and master. Introducing Isildur and Fonaston in the East, both as the Oberkommando Commander West. Oh, but I, I don't just want to know what factions they are, Dane. I want to know what uh, battalions they're fighting for, their mothers, fathers, former battalions of World War One. I. I want to know everything about them. Well, I can't tell you that much, but, you know, they're both forming up here in this case, the... Oh, I don't know. Let's just go with the 21st Panzer Division, which fought both on the Western and the Eastern Front. Ah, oh, so the specialists. Indeed, they are. Uh, great players as well, of course. Vonnie, Von, Von, Vonnie, sorry. Is, Isildur goes as Izzy these days, and he plays with Von Aston. Um, so a Dutch and a Brit are there, both playing as the OKW. First engagement in the North, and we've got our first selection. No surprises there, Dane, of course. Overwatch Doctrine chosen. Very popular, very popular with a lot of players, since it has Jaeger Infantry, very easy to call in. Quite effective. In fact, they used to be a bit too effective. And uh, if you're Von Ivan, you also got the Goliaths. Yes, indeed. Only Von, Von Ivan seems to use them to their true potential. Yet, yeah, do you think the nerf has worked, Dane? How do you think feel about Overwatch now? Do you think it's where it should be? I mean, it's overall dropped off a lot more. Similarly, Jaeger spam has dropped off notably after the nerf, so I'd say it's worked. It still sees usage because the Jaegers are still good. The rest of Doctrine still has a lot of utility, in particular also once they nerfed Sector Assault. So I'd say it's worked. Talking of utility, the guy in the centre right now is Scotch. He's going as penal battalions with some nifty bulletins. He's got 6% uh, uh, less cost for the mines, building 10% faster, with 6% further throwing uh, satchels. So uh, interesting shot tactics coming from the Soviet player. Um, what do you see elsewhere on the map, Dane? Well, in the South, and that's so far having an absolutely easy time. I've had a little picnic, as there's absolutely no <laughs> allied resistance. In fact, Nico folks in the centre there are Scotch, folks in the centre line. Nico, of course, easily push northwards with Scotch, then swing up behind Isildur here. So we can see Fanas is now rushing, realising that, good lord, his opponent, you know, just decided not to bother with them. So, so we basically have the Winter War in the north, and then the Phony War in the south, with uh, Neville Chamberlain chewing on, uh, on butties. More or less, more or less, but uh, Fnason's catching up here, though. He's still trying to prepare a bit, you know, in case this suddenly switch south. And uh, here we go, the cohort of uh, light armor, the M3 in the Universal Carrier. You can hear Dane's cat mewing in the background. What is the name of your cat, Dane? Basil. He's Basil. named after a Ro Eastern Roman Emperor, Basil II. Not Basil Faulty, that is a shame. Here we go, we've got our first potential squad wipe on the go. Of course, no Panzerfaust out quite yet. M3's doing damage, Flamer upgraded. Dane had slow looking bad out there. Indeed, a bit of a slow retreat there, and of course, lack of a I mean, I'm a bit surprised they both went for double, double command missions. They should know it does have a few particular weaknesses versus allies, since they lack Panzerfausts. They do indeed in that early game stretch. The first Rakettenwerfer is rather late. And we've also got the, uh, already got the K-mounted Vickers on the Universal Carrier. Did you miss that or the Bren gun from Coming Heroes 1, Dane? No, not particularly, not particularly. I don't miss the Universal Carrier at all. In fact, I wish it'd go away. <laughs> I think a lot of us uh, would think the same. Good pressure by the Allies in this early game period. That Rakettenwerfer has taken an awful long time to get into position. Indeed, not exactly the fastest counter to it, and uh, no Panzer tracks in sight either. Not quite yet. So, uh, Dane, these players, I presume you've cast a lot of them. You're up to a hell of a lot of episodes on your particular, I don't even want to call it a series, more of an odyssey. Yes, it's my own quest for I don't know what exactly. We're around sort of 2,152 or so, I think. Of course, you've got a cast coming out today. I believe it's rendering as we speak. Uh, oh, here you go. Oh, nice first Rakettenwerfer shot there, Dane. And uh, certainly he took a long time to get onto the field at Asilda, but uh, he more than made up for it with his first shot. Indeed, and a bit of extra salvage for the Germans if they can get their hands on it. Well, they're certainly going for it. They're going for it in spades, all four squads in unison. So uh, we've had an equalization of pressure in this first opening passage of play. 
indeed and Scott is also quickly sneaking someone southwards to hit the southern fuel point under mine he's hitting it with his face and then crawling to it slowly very good but I doubt he's going to be deterred by that possibly not nice uh, cohesive collagenated battle group we'll call it under good grenade there two good grenades in fact oh that second one first grenadier and peril dane Yep, and that could very well look like a what indeed it happens explosively. Yes, yeah, little bits of them are all over the, over the shop. Yeah, but Fnatic here pushing out the looks like the Alfklang's Panzer. I, I couldn't say that if I wanted to, but well, um, you're British. It, it's no. We don't it's need natural. to learn other languages, do we? You know, I know we don't have an empire anymore, but we still like to pretend we do. Indeed, indeed. You still think you got it. Everybody speaks our language, it kind of lulls us into a full sense of security, and, and now we're roughly the equivalent of Burkina Faso or something. I think that might be a bit too lofty of aspirations. Oh, dear God. Right. Some good grenade pressure being put down. What do you see from the teching, Dane? Do we see anything interesting coming out quite yet? Well, both Orbital Commandos players are committing hard to the mechanised Radian headquarters with a Puma following up for his to come up for Nathan's... Uh, Looks so that way he doesn't get completely trounced by any sort of ACs or T70s. That's the dynamics of two versus two. It's so um, it's so coordinated at times. There's so much synergy that you don't really see counters because you can get the thing that counters the counter to your thing out at the same time. <laughs> Indeed, though, it does of course require a great deal of coordination. It's not something I'd expect to see, you know, between random two versus twos. You're not just li listening to the wittering of casters today. We actually have a good player, and it is Dane. Uh, Dane, you've uh, had hit lofty heights recently on the ladder. Yes, I've managed to reach rank one with the Wehrmacht in two versus two, repeatedly. <laughs> I always get pushed back, but I'm the one that consistently sits there, unlike everyone else. Now, have you improved, or has the player base gotten worse? Well, I'd definitely say I've improved... There's definitely also a few, uh, well, boffins out there quite, you know, fumbling about without knowing what to do. <laughs> Indeed. North side, we've got the Puma, which sort of surprisingly has uh, some interesting anti-infantry uh, damage. Oh, <laughs> the first shot killing two men. I think that's a perfect example of that. Indeed, and now the Sturm Pani's joining the front as the Puma draws the attention and pushes around the section, preventing them from uh, defending against the Sturm Pioneers. So, nice push there. Now, we all know that Dane's uh, an avid... Ooh. Good grenade there. Here comes the M3. We'll just keep an eye on this. We know that Dane is an avid fan of military history. Do you can consider the Sturmgewehr the first true assault rifle? Well, that depends on who you ask and sort of what you do. Like, want to consider there's Some that argue there's, I think, uh, the Soviets came up with something and somebody probably American. So look at the first real assault rifle that actually saw any greater numbers and any greater usage. It would be the Sturmgewehr. You can consider the FG-42 or the Fallschirmgewehr. Oh, the what a gun. Have you watched the yeah. uh, the firing of it on YouTube by uh, that dude that does all the auction videos? Yeah, I have. He says it's the it, best gun he's ever fired by far. It sounds absolutely spectacular when it fires. Oh, squad wipe here, just back in Colan. Sorry, Dane. <laughs> Tommy's destroyed no there. AEC is now out, and he's got a daunting task ahead of him because it must be said, Isilda and Von Aston are on an absolute tear at the moment. They've eaten up the map. Indeed, and uh, Fnatic has got a sort of good line in the south. The north has completely collapsed. Nico's forces are not in a good spot. In fact, they're back at base, and uh, it basically is up to Scotch to the line. Though he has gone for Guard's motor, which does give him the Guard's rifle, who are reasonably good at that job. Oh, yeah, very good indeed with those uh, ETRS. They could, of course, uh, button the Luke should it rear its ugly head, but they don't really have, well, I suppose the British guy, Nagano, has the follow-up. He's got the AEC and the uh, six-pounder now just freshly built, so uh, perhaps a little bit of coordinated fire. They could get rid of one of the uh, light armour, the Panzer Corps. Indeed, but there's a potential at that stage that Germany is going to pull ahead for bigger tanks. Here we go, first shot in from the AEC. The Puma's reversing straight after it, though. A tale as old as time, Puma versus AEC. First shot shared. Indeed, AC quickly veers out of that one. No need for a smoke screen, though. Up north, 
Nico is trying to push ahead, but he is not finding an easy passage at the hands of his... Oh, ball. look at that guard's grenade, and then he follows up with the shot there. He tried to get one of those uh, famous grenades on retreat. It's always so nice when you pull one off, eh? Yeah, but it's so rare to pull it off properly. People just have the timing down, and others certainly don't. And I would cast myself in the latter category, but here we go. Nico with some great grenades. Him and Scotch are back together, and, uh, you know... It is often talked about these guys were once known. South. Looks like the scout car's about to hit the mine, and there we go. Scout car down and almost got the engineers too. Two of the uh, engineers die there. And There's a 12.5% chance of that happening. Yep. And up north, Nico has successfully seemingly pierced Isidore's lines, and the northern ally is open to him. Overwatch flares igniting the sky just to reveal to new players just how much of the map that shows. There you go, they're very uh, powerful utility. Boomer's coming in to make an absolute nuisance of itself once more. Indeed, and could actually catch a few, or trap a few there between the sandbags. Oh, that would be devilish. Six pounder and the AC are a little bit late to the party, but the Tommies are lingering. They want to sacrifice their lives for the Empire. Indeed, missed opportunity to think there by Nico to actually entrap the AC, or the Puma, I mean, if you try and go for a deeper flank, he might have caught it. It's been sent packing, at least. There's a spirited fight back from the Allies. They have not They have now just been able to recapture their own fuel and lay their own mine on the said point, but here come the first grenadiers almost immediately. And we got Doxons for Nico and for Nassan as well. Special Operations, meaning he's going to go for the Command Panther Stall, since he's also going for a Puma. And Nico with the tactical support. Not too many surprises there, especially from... Uh... Special Operations, probably the most selected OKW commander in coming era's history. Indeed, indeed. Not there's a lot to select from, but... Uh... <laughs> no, there's like, there's like three worthwhile ones. I don't think we can even count things like Luftwaffe anymore. Well, it's good if you know how to use it and get a bit lucky, but it's a lot damn trickier to get working properly. Yes, it's one of those specialist ones I consider it. Dana, how are we feeling about the performance of the four players so far? Not too much daylight between e any of the teams, really. It seems like it's quite a an fair and equitable battle, and we haven't really gotten started quite yet. Well, neither side has really gotten caught up in pointless meat grinder tactics, so that's something. Oh, saying that, though, the AEC is just catching air over that mound there. The Panzer II Lukes has got to get out of here, but here comes Big Brother Puma to the rescue. Yup. T Center moving in as well. They could theoretically punch the Puma down with that. Talking of punching Pumas, here's a Puma punching through with a great penetration. And that quickly turns the equation in favor of the German army in the center. Ooh, section got wiped out somewhere. Now they are, of course, secondary to this incredibly fierce light armor battle developing. The six pounder is going to spoil the party though and make things rather unfair, but warfare is all about that. You want it to be unfair in your favor. Indeed, indeed, and that would punish the Germans for not bringing up infantry to back up the light vehicles. What? Talking of which, they do finally get a Panzerfaust in tow, but this battle for the center is really starting to boil over now. It, I do note, uh, Imperial Dane, whilst this has been happening, Isilda in the north has been capping up the fuel and the victory points, so Axis with a distinct Material advantage. Indeed, they do have the potential of pulling out and fuel, and also Isidu could theoretically flank the Allies from the north. Certainly gathering his positions. We've got uh, Von Aston in the centre, so great play by the Axis players at this point. Scotch and Nagano, sometimes known as Goldpath 2, are really going to have to clamour to get their medium armour out and try and rectify the situation. Yeah, they've rather managed to captain themselves in a bulge where they're not really getting any worthwhile resources. No, they really need to close the pocket. And uh, here we go. We've got the AC pursuing the Puma. Wants to finish the job, Dane. Indeed, should be able to do it. T-70 moving as well to scurry away any infantry. And um, that's the Puma. North should be very much under our control now. Should be. They've managed to... Uh... Stop themselves getting surrounded. The Axis will be back though, and in greater numbers. And these do I imagine will be taking up some of the Shreya Panzer headquarters. Oh, that folks grenade never stood a chance, Dane. Indeed, executed in cold blood. Yes. Yes, he was. 
Much like in uh, Saving Private Ryan when that guy says, uh, Look, I wash my hands for supper. Indeed, indeed, except that's not what he said. No, he did. The the American, the man that shot him, you, always, you can always trust the Americans, Dane. There, I'm they... going to have you disagree with that one. <laughs> Little known movie trivia fact for anybody that's watched Saving Private Ryan. It was actually speaking Romanian, saying, I'm Romanian, I'm Romanian, please don't shoot me. Yes, because they actually had a lot of troops there, sort of from uh, Eastern Europe. Mostly Russians, though, prisoners of war actually manning uh, the defences. You can always they count were... on them, though, uh, they, they reliably say. Well, yeah. A lot of them surrendered and then promptly got handed over to Stalin. Oh, well, he probably counted on them in a very bit. different way. <laughs> they don't tell you about that bit. Six pounders pushing in. The Tommies were a diversion. The Luke is, Luke's is going to get pushed away. Still, though, if you look on the top of your mini-map, uh, Isilda's fighting back in the north. So, oh, God! Good shot by the six-pounder there. Main gun destroyed. Indeed. Sadly, the light vehicles do not fare well at head-on assaults. Also, Scotch is flooding an awful lot of bloody manpower. He really needs to, you know, do something with it. Cashes would be a great choice here. You can also, of course, get the 120 mil. Not that you often see that in Elite Level 2 versus 2, it seems. It's seeing some usage in there, but on a map like this, and with the current state of warfare, it's not going to be wildly effective. No, it, it often ends up being wildly ineffective. And when it is effective, it's pretty much a nuclear bomb cannon, and, and oftentimes it's a damp squib. Yeah, well, the problem is it's more of a, like open maneuver warfare map, so the heavy mortar kind of lacks a bit. How do you feel about this particular 2 versus 2 map, Dane? Is this one of your favourites? It's a very intensive saloon display. Some players go like, can they actually handle large maps or are they just the type of version of locking down a choke point and then, you know, fiddling with their thumbs? <laughs> nice euphemism there. I'm sure you would have said something a little bit more risque on your own stream. Possibly. <laughs> you want to catch Imperial Dane's stream? Um, this video will pretty, pretty much upload as his stream goes live, so always tune in for that for some uh, endearing entertainment. Let's put it that way. T-70s backing away because the Pumas pursuing. The first Grenadiers are trying to push in under a hail of MG-34 fire. Indeed, and we got a Pantolonoi for this lure. That's going to give the Allies a bit of a headache, in particular Scotch. The first piece of medium armour to come out will be the Panzer IV of Isilda. AEC is going after the veterancy 2 Panzer II. The Pumas watching over, giving covering fire, gets the killing blow. And pops a smoke screen to discreetly fall away. Beautiful, Dane. It's almost as though we're uh, we're selling the AEC to respective new owners here. What a marketing yeah. job. Indeed, indeed. But the German overall effort is slightly falling apart. They're relying too much on head-on attacks rather than trying to outmaneuver. That tends to be, I would say, a slightly common Oberkommand versus Florentine games. Yeah. These are the ones I end up playing with. Good mind sweeping in the north by Isolde. Losing a few of his squad mates' faces, but uh, still doing the job. He's done that a few times recently. Good mining by uh, Nagano in the north. Indeed. Panzer fighting southwards. So machine gun being added for that lovely infantry murdering capability. <laughs> and the Pintle Mount is very Terminator esque. He kind of just loves to gun people down. Get some, get some. He's almost there, Dane. Indeed, indeed. Here he comes. Fast, though, I feel like really should consider just taking up Ryan and trying to solve the. Oh, look, he's good. Oh, I was so so certain he was going to pop out and finish the job. That would have been hilarious. Well, it was a close one. Ooh, grenade on the machine gun up close. Oh, Didn't quite get the job done. T70 does, though, and but the Panzer IV is going to be more than enough to push him away so they can reclaim the weapon. Indeed. Are you an MG34 or an MG42 fanboy, Dane? Which do you prefer? Mm, I like them both. Different ways. They have their users. Because there are people that will tell you the MG34 is the better, earlier war, more refined weapon with better components. But then people, some people just say that Hitler's buzzsaw is the superior gun. And of course, it's still still designs that use it to basis to this day. Well, I mean, certain people have preferences. They weight things higher than other things in, and that's that. I mean, the MG-34 in some ways was probably easier to handle for a less experienced soldier because it had a low rate of fire, but the MG-42 just got the killing done. It was a psychological weapon of war as well. There's a lot of reports of just the mere sound of it is enough to uh, make soldiers think twice. 
Indeed, the Americans had training videos just to tell them, you know, it doesn't hurt as badly as it sounds. Of course, <laughs> it did, but the trend, when you can't, you know, make them bulletproof, you just got to lie to them and think, you know, it's, yes. yeah, it's, no it's no problem. We've never lied to you. We're America. I remember that video was saying, your gun may only have 200 rounds per minute and may be susceptible to jamming, but it still fires when it needs to. <laughs> Uh, Panzer IV with uh, a lot of pyrotechnics there doing the job of just bossing the center, keeping the central victory point under Axis control because they do have a certain amount of victory point pressure down Dane, uh, which is very alliterative. Uh, Sildur and Von Asten have a distinct advantage at the moment, and this Panzer IV epitomizes it. AC goes in. Some decent shots. Raketenwerf is ready, though. He could quickly turn the tide here, Nico's AC, which would leave him in a very bad spot since he's stuck with a centaur. Which, while great versus infantry, is not very effective versus tanks. At least, we... not now. It used to be. Too good. Yes, at one point, it was pretty much the most powerful unit in the game. We do have the T-3485 variant coming out for Scotch. So they will pack a bit more of a punch, and certainly it'll tide them over until the late game, at least. Nice destruction of the MG-34 there. Only Raketenwerf is standing in their way, so one of these Tommies is going to get it. There you go. Meanwhile, in the center, spirited fighting... Right well, flank by the centaur. Pretty tasty, eh? It's almost as though we jinxed him. Possibly, but that requires some really weird time stuff. It does. <laughs> it require us to... You're changing the space parallels and the paradox of uh, relic RNG dynamics. Puma's coming in for the finishing blow there. The shed stands in his way. Can't quite get it off. Indeed. That shed. T-35 has arrived, and that's going to give the Germans a bit more of a headache since the Panzer IV is not super effective against it. No, it often, well, it certainly can't finish the job, but it can go to head-to-head -to -head for a time. It's all about getting your supporting fire in there. and you... Indeed. Fonassen is still very much determined just to stall for the Command Panther, despite at this stage having the resources for other stuff. I mean, he could almost probably get away with the King Tiger. No surprises there. I do believe that Relic held that, tied the hands of the uh, the modders behind their backs and said they couldn't just remove all call-in tanks from the game, which would have been preferable, I think. Yeah, but, you know, to an extent I can understand call-in armour. It's just at times... Like, it used to be at one point it was actually more easy and efficient to just calling a heavy tank, you know, this day just even built a symbol panda 4. Oh, now God. it's sort of slightly different, but I mean, it usually tends to sort of boil down to like what is more fast and efficient. Yeah, and it seems to have always been calling armor at various points in the game. Uh, so let's call it as we see it, Dane. I mean, the Allies have certainly gained, regained control of the center. We're now waiting for the next uh, big things to come out from Axis. We know we've got the Command Panther coming out. How best for the Allies to combat it? I mean, Nick is like going to end up with a Firefly that could go for the Crocodile. Scotch, I imagine, will build up more T-35s and back that with the Asian Five. He has wisely by now built a fuel cache so they can that way, you know, build up more resource pressure versus the Germans and drown them beneath a tide of tanks. That's not the kind of tide you want to be drowned beneath, no, that's it... for certain. But uh, Allies do not have any large late-game heavy tanks at their disposal gonna have to as you say try and swarm them in true horde I mean, style the crocodile or the churchill tank that's a pretty big one it certainly allows you to if if you support it well you can use it as the breakthrough weapon that's for certain no late game tank destroyers in this particular game and also something that's omitted thus thus far and i'm really happy about this we haven't had any rocket artillery quite yet not yet i mean nick was not going to get it because he went for uh, tactical support Scots can always go for the Kushan course. Katushin always is doing Fanaston with the Stukasa Fuss, though. I don't think it would be an amazing choice here. But oh, we no. Here we go. Goes for it, as I say it. Yeah, I was. I jinxed it, Nane. I'm ever so sorry. I thought we'd have one, two versus two. That wasn't dominated by rocket artillery. And then here it comes. I mean, it's going to force the Allies to be less concentrated in the defences of the centre, but if they begin splitting up, the Stukasa Fuss is going to be about as useful as a rubber duck. Or a chocolate fire guard. Or a sandpaper dildo. There's, there's various analogies you can use. 
Yes, though I'm not entirely sure what sort of things you get to use with those. <laughs> So we do have the Stukas of Fus on the way. We've got uh, Nagano's battling back hard in the centre. He's got a damaged engine critical off on the Panzer IV. He's just lost an MG inside the house. He's trying to get in there. Six pounders getting some excellent shots from afar there, Dane. Now in attack ground territory. Will he finish the job? He could also rush in the AC by going northwards and then sort of flanking out through the fields. But so far, Niku does not seem to quite think about that. In fact, it looks like Scott's just going to push up with the T-35 to do the job. Letting his, letting his teammates carry the burden of the risk. The Rakettenwerf is wailing on him all the while. T-34's now. Oh. Puma pretty much saved it there by jamming the turret ring of the T-45. Oh dear, oh dear. I'm surprised the AC just ends up... Oh, it's going! A bit better late than never, I guess. But they have cleared one of the Rakettens with some excellent infantry fire from Nagana. Here he comes, just as the Command Panther makes his way onto the field. Will he finish the job, or will he... Ah, uh, that does not... Oh, oh, so close! Yes, indeed, he dies a martyr! Oh, dear. Yep, Pandavor's down just as hits Vetsch 3. Bit of a <laughs> better loss there for his little Oh, they've stolen a Rakettenwerfer as well, so... Uh, pretty decent push there, you would say. AEC for a Panzer IV, I'll take that. And Nico there going for the Firefly. Nice. And Scotch with another T-35 out of far out, so more or less as predicted. Terrible Stuka there, not really hitting anything. And that's kind of the thing with the Stukas at first. He tends to be terrible a lot of the time. It's, uh, it can be a very erratic weapon. It's almost as though it's law of averages. You want two of them and you want to just constantly keep at it. Eventually you'll hit something. Panther is going in. T-34's found it out though with a marked target pushing it away. More just the psychology of the marked target, I would say, but the six-pounder was recruited. And the panther quickly falls back half health. Puma in the centre is uh, not really cheating much, except being a target. The north, we've got Stern Pioneers battling for the Reich, and Poach Grenadiers just sitting in situ, daring the Allies to advance. And the South Scotch is having a nice time unraveling for Nassan's territories, going the fuel and the victory point there while they all focus north centre. South really has been a phony war in this game. It's been hardly any action down there. It tends to be a common move that some part of the map gets neglected. So good, I would say, situational awareness there by Scotch and actually realising there is a South. <laughs> have you watched, uh, just a quick uh, military history uh, segue, have you watched They Will Not Grow Old yet, Dane? I have not. I have not. You need to. It's absolutely the best uh, thing, other than World at War, I've ever seen about uh, military history, that's for certain. Well, I'll try and look into it. It's all real footage as well. Uh, Peter Jackson basically spent ages remodelling all loads of World War One footage. Panther's gone in there. Centaur's having to reverse away. No real da Oh, yes, there is real danger. Sherman Firefly. Self-propelled anti-tank gun, as British Doctrine referred to it as. Fun fact. I suppose with its rate of fire, can it? I know it is a tank, but it doesn't really feel like tanks at the, at the times. When the flash powder's blinded all the crew members for a good two minutes, is it, yeah. really, is it really a tank? Well, I mean, that's sort of the funny thing about British Doctrine. It was very much based off World War I armor doctrine. That's kind of why they didn't have tank destroyers. They had self-propelled anti-tank guns. Oh, here comes the Panther, forcing that T-34 away. Backed up the Pumas, but a Soviet crude six pounder gun assists. Meanwhile, in the north, we've had uh, Nagano reclaim that second victory point. Stukas of firing, Dane. Where's it going to land? Mm, who knows, but probably after the anti tank gun and kills Petrov, but that's it. Much better, Katusha Barrage. This still does not see the danger quite yet. Very lucky for his folks, Grandiers, not to be hit there. Ooh. Oh, speaking First... of the devil. Nine kills so far. Oh. 12 kills. Crew's wiped. Shows the difference between the two. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. Of course, the uh, Katusha pretty much still in service to this day. Just very, uh, slightly different uh, uh, tractors at the front. And different rockets. But they look similar, Dane. The MLRS in use with the Russian Federation. A bit. 
Well, certainly the Syrian Katushas look the same. <laughs> they probably are the same. They actually, they've been using STGs and all sorts. There's lots of World War II stuff finds itself in the Middle East. We've got T-34 going straight in. It's found a Schwer Panzerschlepper in the east. Didn't quite finish it off. The panel was scared off by the Schwer Panzer headquarters. Yeah, she can't. You don't want to mess with that truck. Surprisingly mobile for a truck. Nico is going to put pressure in freshly from the north here with the centre on the Firefly, backed up by Scotch's T-35. Oh god, that's a trio of disaster for the Axis. They're gonna have to really defend hard and well here. They've got three Raketenwerfers, they should be fine. Yep, and I think Isendor is stalling for the King Tiger now. Meanwhile in the west we've got the Command Panther, Coordinated Fire and Mort Target both in. The Axis and Allies derivatives of the same ability. Looks like the Axis is gonna win out. Has he seen also the Katusha? No, he hasn't. It looks like the Katusha's safe. Yep, but he got a T-45. Not bad. What happened in the East while that was going down that day? Any progression? They managed to push back Scotch and Nickers on the salt there. But with no casualties, really, a sort of heavy one. Oh, almost got the centaur here. But not quite. Sadly, it uh, escapes. Command Panther swinging up the south here, going for a bit of a swing there. Nico's troops were trying to grenade the retreating folks, kind of is. Ryan being the operative word here comes the Katusha. Looks like it's firing on the mid. Takes out one Raket and Verfa. Stukas Vus is coming up to uh, give some covering fire. Meanwhile, Puma's in a, a battle to the death with that T 3485. Might just win it, hitting Veteran C4. Indeed. That's pretty good there. Oh, final shot bounced. Two fireflies, Dane. This isn't good. This isn't good at all. That's pretty bad for a King Tiger. Oh! He's just hit the field. King Tiger's hitting the field. Just had the Katusha go down and Koenig's Tiger's out, Dane. Give us some facts. Well, this particular version is uh, the one with the production series to it. I know the normal thing is to think they're made by Henschel and by um, Paul Ship, but the thing is, they didn't have anything to do with the turret. The turret was actually made by Crook. The one thing that I was actually thought about uh, was the gun, which Krupp also wanted to make, but uh, Rhein Mattel Bursig, the one who made the Flak 88, was also in competition for that one. In fact, it got so much out of hand between the two companies that the Minister of, I think, Industry or Production, like that, Dr. Tort, yes, there's a man called that, had to step in and tell him to bloody well <laughs> knock it off. Oh, God. King Tiger's uh, having difficulty getting into action. Transmission failure, it seems. But as soon as it gets into 